omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnibenevolent. These are the traditional labels that are applied to a theistic conception of God. Is there a way to think of a God that isn't the omni-God? That's the question I'm talking about on the 39th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hey guys, got a really great episode for you today. I recently spoke with a professor of philosophy about some basic religious concepts, about what we mean by the term God, some non-standard definitions of God. We had a great conversation about faith, the reasons for faith, what faith means, and the limitations, if any, of the rational methodology. My guest is Dr. John Bishop, who has been a professor of philosophy at the University of Auckland for more than 20 years. He is the author of Natural Agency and Believing by Faith, in addition to a bunch of professional articles on the topic of the philosophy of religion. This interview, I think, is the longest interview so far, and it was very kind of Dr. Bishop to speak with me for so long because we went over the allotted time, but I was having such a good conversation that I figured I'd milk it just a little bit longer because I know you guys are really going to appreciate, as I did, what he had to say. Also, I'm very pleased to announce that this project of creating philosophy and big ideas outside of academia is growing, and I'm looking for some help. So I just posted an article on my website, steve-patterson.com, go check it out where I'm outlining exactly what I need help with. I'm looking for an intern that can do audio editing, some proofreading, some research, some strategic research, social media stuff. Right now, the position would be for less than 10 hours a week, and it's an unpaid position, but as things grow, it's very possible that this could develop into something paid. So if you've been listening to the show, you really appreciate it. You're excited about the project. Check out the website. There's more details there. Maybe we can work together. All right, I hope you enjoy my interview with Professor John Bishop of the University of Auckland. So first of all, thank you very much for sitting down and speaking with me today. A pleasure. I have several questions for you related to basic concepts in theology, in Christianity. Um, Part of my conversations with people is not just talking about strict topics in philosophy. I'm really interested in theological claims because I think there's some truth to be found, but in my experience, it's mired in a lot of poor arguments or things that don't make sense, at least to me. So I'm going around talking not just with theologians, but with pastors trying to sort out the good from the bad. And uh, like I said before we started recording, a few of your colleagues recommended you in particular for doing that. (laughs) Yes. Well, I certainly am sympathetic to the idea that although, you know, there's this very familiar language where we talk about God and God's actions and God's will for us and so on, um, there's a lot of obscurity about what we really mean by it. And that's an excellent place to start. Yeah, and and I think many, many people, you know, have the sense that this language does something important and it (laughs) connects them, it's capable of connecting them with what reality is really like. Um, but when you actually ask them to explain how that is so, um, they, they find it difficult to mm-hmm. give an answer, and they probably just say, well, we use this uh, language, and we realize that it doesn't operate in exactly the same way as ordinary factual language does. Right. You know? I mean, when we're talking about God, um, we're not really thinking that God is a person you know, exactly like us. They, they realize that. But trying to understand, from a philosophical point of view, what exactly we might mean by yeah. talking about God is, is really very challenging. And this is something that I'm very interested in. I can see you are too. Okay, so that's the perfect place to start. The word God means a million different things to a million different people. And I know growing up, I had, my background is in Christian evangelicalism is where I was raised. I kind of fell away from that, and I'm just now coming back around to some religious beliefs but what do you mean, as somebody who's a philosopher who appreciates clear definitions and clear thinking, clear concepts, what does that word mean to you? Right, okay, well I I will answer that question, but um, I want to make a tangential remark first. Okay. Um, Because one of the things, I mean, if, if we are going to be trying to clarify what God means, 
I think we have to connect with the tradition, okay. you know, the tradition in which you were brought up and, and so was I, although my tradition wasn't so evangelical, it, it was more sort of liberal theological, mm -hmm. theologically, um, and uh, somewhat um, Anglican and Anglo-Catholic. So perhaps we have slightly different backgrounds. But I think um, whatever God means, um, if we're going to have a proper understanding of it, it's got to connect back to the, the tradition and make sense somehow within that tradition. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that that tradition says um, classically is that God is incomprehensible. Okay. Um, so that the <laughs> idea of, if you're asking me what is the definition, you know, can you, you know, people have different definitions and what is your neat definition, mm -hmm. right? The first thing I have to say is I don't think it's possible to offer something that is a, a, a neat definition of, okay. God, of what God is. And when the, uh, you know, when the uh, medievals, um, uh, uh, you know, said that God is incomprehensible, um, I don't think they meant, as we might hear it now, that um, what God is or who God is is unintelligible. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, if it were just unintelligible, then we would we, we would just shut up. You right. know, we wouldn't be able to do any philosophizing <laughs> right. about it. Um, but what I think they meant was that we can't get the kind of understanding that gives us a complete intellectual control of what it is we're talking about. Okay. So, that, so who or what God is is always going to outrun that kind of total comprehension. Okay. But I think it is very important to pursue the goal of trying to make what God is um, in, in, as intelligible as we can. Mm -hmm. right. So. That's a sort of prelim preliminary remark. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in order to explain what I now think God is, I probably have to um, make some remarks about the sort of history of my thinking about this. Yes, please do. Um, I mean, as I'm sure you're aware, within um, analytical Anglophone philosophy, um, there's a very widespread view that it is possible to make pretty intelligible what we're talking about when we're talking about God. Um, if you look at the writings of philosophers like um, Alvin Plantinga or Richard Swinburne, they will think, say things like, to believe that God exists is to believe that there is a person who created the universe ex nihilo, whatever that may mean, um, and um, who uh, is um, supremely powerful, indeed omnipotent, um, knows everything, omniscient, um, is morally perfect, um, and uh, who, who has purposes um, which relate to true human destiny. Okay. You know, something, something of that kind. Right. Um, and uh, people now very often refer to that as the personal omni-god mm -hmm. um, conception of God. <laughs> Um, and for a long time, I suppose, I held that kind of conception as, um, or at least I believed that that was um, philosophy, tell, um, that was the best that philosophy could do in making intelligible this theological tradition. Okay. Um, and, but I was dissatisfied with that conception of God. And so I thought of myself as um, exploring alternatives to that, as I would have described it, classical conception of God. And what was your difficulty? What did you not like about that? What did I not like about it? Okay. Yeah. Well, well, that's quite a long topic. But uh, but to cut to the chase, <laughs> the thing that's most worrying about it um, arises from the problem of evil. Okay. Um, because um, if you believe there is such a God. You have to believe that that when something like the Holocaust, you know, some mass tragedy, some perversion um, of goodness occurs, uh, like a genocide, um, there is a powerful agent who could stop it, mm -hmm. um, who presumably, for very good reason, is not doing so, right, um, and. Um, and that's a very hard thing to do. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, you might have a kind of Ivan Karamazov response to this. He says, well, look, 
you know, if there is an agent who could stop, I mean, he was actually talking about the torture of a child, um, or at least the character in Dostoevsky's novel is, is made to talk about um, the torture of a child, and he says, well, look, um, I will not um, call God good um, if he stands by and does nothing while um, this child is essentially tortured mm -hmm. to death. Um, and uh, I have a lot of sympathy for that response, but people might say, well, you don't know the whole picture. Mm -hmm. You know, if you understood the, um, uh, the greatness of the goods that are somehow linked um, in ways that you can't possibly fathom mm -hmm. to allowing these horrors to happen, um, then you would realize that God has an adequate excuse. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, intellectually, even if emotionally one finds that rather worrying, um, uh, intellectually you can see that it might be possible to construct a view of that kind. And, mm -hmm. and there's a vast amount of writing about theodicy um, in which people are trying to do precisely that. Um, but uh, in my own recent work, uh, I've come to the conclusion that however um, sophisticated a theodicy that you provide, um, you are going to have to understand God as one who, um, first of all, um, sustains um, people through the experience of terrible suffering, hmm. um, either um, as um, um, victims or as perpetrators, right, including, so we have to include the perpetrators here, um, and then ultimately restores um, things to, to justice and peace and harmony, right? Um, so, I mean, a lot, a lot of theodicies will say God has to care very much about this kind of suffering, um, but he's got eno enormous resources to do this. A writer like Marilyn Adams is a very good example of this. Um, and out of his infinite resources, um, he will bring everyone, both perpetrators and victims, um, of, e of horrific evils into the joy of eternal relationship with him. Hmm. You know. um, now, you know, those rather sophisticated kind of theodicies, though, seem to me to have one basic flaw, that they're going to portray God as a powerful person who has a relationship with creatures in which he first sustains them through suffering and then wonderfully compensates um, for it and defeats it and makes good on it. Mm -hmm. And what I want to say about that is, what ca is that um, a, uh, a perfectly loving kind of personal relationship? I mean, imagine what we would think um, on a human scale if somebody did that. Mm -hmm. If I put you through some you know, fairly terrible suffering, um, uh, only because this was the best way to get you into um, the experience of some great good, Right. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that um, the kind of relationship that I would have you with you would not be um, the most perfect possible kind of interpersonal relationship. It would st it would be sort of inherently manipulative. Mm, yeah. Um, and so I think that even the most sophisticated theodicies are not going to be able to get over um, that kind of problem. Um, and so for me, now I. I acknowledge that people may have answers to that, or they may not have the same kind of intuition. They might say, because it's God um, who is doing all this, um, what we would find unacceptable in human terms may be perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so I don't think this is a knockdown argument, um, but it, so to speak, clarifies for me my reason and a reason which other people might share, you know, um, why they cannot endorse this particular conception of God. Okay. So that the idea of God as a person like us, although with unlimited power, unlimited knowledge and unlimited goodness, who so to speak superintending the whole of reality all the time, seems to me to be a conception that is not adequate. Okay. Um, so, that's my reason for being unhappy with what I would be inclined to judge 
is probably the dominant conception of God, um, but by no means the only conception of God that you find amongst um, philosophers of the analytic um, persuasion. Okay, so the next, the next natural question to ask is, if not the personal omni-god, what are the other options? Maybe not all of them, but, but one but, or but, yes. some and, and, potential. And what are the ones that are attracting me? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, one, one thing um, that happened to me very much as the result um, of my interaction with a student here um, who is now a PhD student and he's in the process of completing his uh, doctorate on the problem of evil, Thomas Harvey, um, was that I came to realize that although I had been brought up to think that this personal omnigod um, account was the, f the best philosophical account of classical theism, as a matter of fact, if you go back and look at the medievals themselves, right, there are reasons to think that they didn't endorse a metaphysics of God as a supreme person superintending everything. Mm -hmm. That they recognized that that way of talking was a way of talking by analogy. Mm -hmm. And when you ask them what they really think about the nature of God, they tend to retreat to what is known as the apophatic. Um, in other words, they, uh, they describe God in ways that convey to us important understandings of what he is not, but do not purport to tell us um, directly what he positively is. Okay. So, so if, you, if you look at um, uh, classical philosophical theology, right, um, God will be said to be atemporal, mm -hmm. immutable, impassable, right, you know, not, not um, limited by time, right, uh, not subject to change, impassable meaning um, not the kind of thing that undergoes processes or anything else, right. Um, and uh, and and necessary, which means not amongst the things that are contingent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there is this very puzzling one, which looks positive, um, that says that God is simple. What immediately comes to your mind um, if you hear somebody say God is simple um, as a matter of interest? Uh, just uh, uh, like a simpleton. That's what I think. If, some, if you that's call a you person mean. a simple, you're yeah. simple-minded. Yes. yes. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, and you think, well, it can't be that. <laughs> and you might think, surely, from the point of view of, um, you know, the divine intellect, it must have an amazing complexity and sophistication that we can't even fathom. Mm -hmm. So what on earth could simple mean? And, uh, um, uh, and you think, well, how, how could God be this ultimately absolutely simple thing? You know? So it, it looks kind of nonsensical, right? Um, but, uh, but what they mean is that there is no, there is no composition of, in God. God isn't made up of any parts. Mm -hmm. you know? Now, um, that's, that is still rather puzzling, right? Um, but what, what really clarifies it for me is when you realize that they mean that in particular God doesn't have the composition of essence and existence that everything else they thought has. Mm. So, uh, again, this is terminology that isn't terribly familiar to us now, right? Um, but just to illustrate it, um, uh, you and I have composition of essence and existence because we both have the essence of um, humanity. We're both human beings, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but you instantiate it. You, it, it exists in you in the particular, you know, Steve kind of way, right. and it exists in me in the particular John kind of way, and so on. Right, um, and so we are, we are the kinds of things that are, as we might say now more familiarly, we are instances of a general kind, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what they're saying is, God isn't an instance of a general kind. Mm -hmm. God isn't just a kind of things amongst other things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and and in, so the idea of divine simplicity is a way of signaling the absolute transcendence of God, that God can't be identified as any kind of thing. And, and for that reason, right, although 
Of course, the medievals do use personal language about God as much as any theologians do, and no doubt will continue to do. In their philosophizing, they, they were, I think, much more cautious than contemporary philosophers have been <laughs> in saying we mustn't take this language as delivering to us an intelligible metaphysics. However sort of psychologically compelling it might be, and it might actually be that in a certain sense God wants us to think of him in personal terms, but as a matter of, or at least to relate to him in personal terms, because that's the only thing we can do, we are personal beings, right? As a matter of fact, when we, for our understanding, when we're doing fides quirens intellectrum, faith-seeking understanding, we mustn't um, get too hung up on the idea that God actually is a person. And uh, otherwise, we will get into these sorts of problem, problems that we're having to say mm -hmm. when something terrible happens. There's a person more powerful than us who's letting it happen. What could his reason be? Could he be punishing me? And all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That, I think for them, those kinds of problems were sort of blocked off. Right. So, one of the things, and, and as I say, I was persuaded about this by Thomas. Um, you know, so this is a very good example and something that we always say we are open to, um, uh, namely learning from our students. But this made quite a difference to, to my thinking um, because I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, um, it's not at all obvious that my desire to, to find alternatives to the personal omni-god conception is, amounts to trying to step outside classical theism. It might turn out to be rediscovering it. Okay. Um, so now, of course, in order to do that properly, one would have to go off and become a great expert in sort of medieval philosophy, and mm -hmm. I haven't, you know, been able to do this. But, um, but I have continued to think about what the alternatives might be, you know, from my own point of view. But, but now I'm thinking, maybe what I'm now thinking, if you go back and compare it with what um, medieval philosophers thought, um, maybe there would be some connection there, and, and I'm not necessarily, you know, um, coming up with something absolutely new. And indeed, you know, whoever does in philosophy. <laughs> so when you made that distinction between existence and essence, God doesn't have existence, can we say God doesn't have any essence? Is there no essence either to God? Is there neither? Does, does neither category apply to your conception of God? Well, um, well, he doesn't have the, the composition of essence and existence, which I, okay. I take it to mean he just he isn't an instance of any kind, even the unique instance of some kind. So, um, so, so what? So, but on the other hand, um, presumably, um, you know, God um, does have uh, essence. Of course, what Aquinas says at one point is that God is. Um, uh, ipsum esse subsistens, you know, that God, that mean? it means being itself subsisting. <laughs> okay, what, does <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? What does that mean? Yes, yes. Um, and, um, uh, and of course, another thing that Aquinas says is God is pure act. There is no potentiality in God, right? So, um, so when it comes to God, it's not as if God has the composition of essence and existence. He's al it's almost as if he's saying God's essence is his existence. There isn't, there isn't any distinction. And in us, there's supposed to be the distinction of essence and existence. But in God, there isn't that distinction. Um, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't have essence. It's just that he doesn't have an essence that is separate from his existence. Right? Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, that's... That was what the medieval philosophers would have said, or somebody okay. like Aquinas would have said. Um, but, but I think, um, you know, I, I myself, I mean, I, I can see you've, you've got a lot of questions about this, and, and I think, in a sense, I, I myself um, uh, haven't really gone the route of trying to understand more in a scholarly way um, what the, um, the framework of concepts that, that we find in medieval philosophy um, provides for us by way of an understanding of God. I'm just sort of signaling that um, it, it, 
I think it's wrong to assume that what they were really getting at was the personal omnigod mm -hmm, theory. Mm -hmm. I think actually they were setting themselves again. Well, they, they say things that rule that out. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm trying to do from my own contemporary context is to, uh, t to try and make intelligible what it might mean to say that God exists mm -hmm. if it doesn't mean um, that there is a personal omnigod. Okay, so, so there, there are lots of questions um, that I have about that, both epistemological and metaphysical. So let's stick with the metaphysical first. I'm trying to understand um, the term exist in this uh, way of thinking about it because I have a general notion of existence, of being. Of, I can think about, you know, there's a phone sitting here on a table and it's not the case that there is, uh, you know, a rotary phone. The rotary phone does, isn't spa it spatially exist, maybe the concept of it exists, but it yeah, yeah. lacks that property of existence. And that concept of existence applies to everything. I, I could say something like, everything exists. Yeah, yeah. If it's a thing, it exists. And I find that satisfactory and kind of complete, but there's this concept of God that when I've spoken with people doesn't seem to fit into that category. No, quite. I, okay, yeah. so how can I, how can I understand that? Okay, yeah. well, well, what I think is worth exploring is that um, to say that God exists is not really to um, identify some item and attribute existence to it, as we might with, you know, a book or a phone or a human being or a tree or something. Um, I think um, it's to say something about the whole of reality. Hmm. Um, As a unified thing? Yes. I, 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 um, uh, if you can call it, I mean, it's a pretty extraordinary thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, I think it is to say something about the whole of reality, and and what it says certainly implies that reality is unified. And what I, what I have been exploring is that the basis of that unification has to do with the idea of purpose. Um, that the whole of reality is unified because it exists to achieve a certain purpose, uh, end, or you know, to use the um, the Greek word telos. You know, um, so the um, and after all, um, there uh, certainly in the tradition, um, the idea, of course, it's, there's a very strong idea in theism that God is the ultimate source of all that is, right? Um, but there is also the idea um, that uh, God is the ultimate end, purpose, or point, or goal of all that exists, right? Um, and I think that perhaps it's worth trying to recover the idea of God as end or purpose um, uh, in order to understand what we might mean by saying that God exists. So when I think of the concept of purpose, it's, for me, inescapably tied to mind. <clears throat> that if you had no mind, you would have no purpose. That there's, yes. in the sense that that's a mind-dependent phenomenon is purpose. So if God is purpose, how, what, is the, the, what does that mean? If, that, that, if I were to say, you know, if, from the internal standpoint, if I have a purpose, it's something like I have intentionality to reach an end state. Yes, yes. But you're saying God is the end state? Um, well, um, no, not precisely. In fact, I, I think um, uh, I would be inclined to be extremely cautious about um, identifying God with anything in particular. I think looking for something to identify God with is not going to work. Um, can, uh, I, can I jump in just right there? Yes. Because it's hard for me to... This, when we say the term God, can't, we can't identify anything in particular. Even right there, it's hard for me to wrap my head around how yes. you could be talking about something when we're saying it's not a something. It, it almost yes, that's right. It smells like a lot of like a logical contradiction, just kind of on its face. Oh yes, I see. Uh, no, okay. I quite understand that. Okay. Yes. Yes. So how how can I get um, past that? Okay. 
<laughs> right. Well, um, uh, I think only indirectly. Okay. Um, if you butt your head against that too directly, you won't get past it. Okay. So um, could we say so, that? So, so, so what? The, the way the way I have um, done it, or at least tried exploring doing it. You know, I'm not necessarily saying I can succeed in doing this. Um, is to say, well, let instead of instead of trying to say, well, you know, God exists is really affirming the existence of some item, and what with what item, you know, however wonderful it may be, could we identify um, that thing that we call God? Instead of doing that, um, let's let's ask ourselves the question: um, what it might mean to say that all of reality um, is. Uh, divinely created or is a divine creation, right? Okay. Um, and uh, so what, what I want to suggest is um, that to say that reality is a divine creation is to say that reality quite inherently um, uh, exists for the realization of a purpose Okay. A purpose that is supremely good. Um, and as a matter of fact, I also want to add, and the ultimate explanation of why reality exists at all is the fact that it does actually achieve the purpose that is inherent to it. Okay. Um, so we'd set aside for a moment the question, but what precisely is God, but we're looking at something that is surely absolutely central to theism, which is what does it mean to say that um, reality is God's creation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and I'm, I'm saying what that means is to make a claim about all of reality as united because inherently it has a certain purpose, that purpose is the supreme good, and reality exists at all only because that purpose is actually achieved. Okay. Right. Um, now, of course, you know, you can go into a discussion of what the supreme good is, of course. And if, uh, you know, since we both have a Christian background, um, one could, you know, for the sake of discussion, use the, um, uh, the Christian claim, right, that the, the ultimate good um, is, uh, is existing in love. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, um, uh, um, with God and with with all else that is, you know. Um, so, um, so you could say that to say that reality is God's creation from a Christian point of view is to say that all that exists exists for the sake of making love a concrete reality. And the only reason why there is anything at all is because that at the within reality, that happens. That does actually happen. I right. like that. Uh, yes. I, so could I could I rephrase it this way? Yes. Yes. In a sense, what you're saying is all of reality itself is something like a love generating machine. Yes. <laughs> something like that. Okay. Yes. Um, now this, um, I mean, this might sort of give us a transition into the epistemological, mm -hmm. because. It is far from obvious that that's so, <laughs> right. you know. Uh, <laughs> even if, you know, you and I have experienced, um, uh, you know, states of existence in which love is realized, mm -hmm. you know, um, nevertheless, there's a whole lot out there that um, is, um, f fails to achieve that ideal or seems to be uh, directed um, uh, towards undermining it. It seems to be actually perverse. So it's not, you know, one isn't claiming that one can look at reality and decide that it's rationally compelling <laughs> that uh, that reality must be this love generating machine. Well, let me let me um, posit, just float this idea that popped in my head. Yes, so, yes. part of my own background of research is understanding um, like market dynamics and in, in like economics. So in a marketplace, if you have a good that is successful and, and creates value for people, it kind of naturally becomes, generates wealth for whoever created that thing. And if you have a product that hurts people, 
then it's not going to sell very well and it's going to naturally go bankrupt, if you will. Yes. So perhaps in this conception, the reason that we have this mixture of love and not love is because in this generation device, you kind of have the natural growth of the love things, yes. the, the loving generators, and the natural death of the, yes. the non-love things. Might That's that right. be an explanation? It might be, okay. yes. yes. So, um, so, I mean, th this way of putting it is still going to lead to a kind of problem of evil, but there may be um, answers, and those answers might be more satisfactory, precisely because, although we are talking about reality having an inherent purpose, we are not talking about um, some being whose purpose it is, who's constructing reality for the purpose of realizing that purpose and who is therefore responsible, etc. Mm -hmm. We haven't, even though um, it's rather compelling to use that imagery, mm -hmm. right, uh, when we actually um, ask ourselves, you know, what our strict understanding, what the metaphysics is actually telling us, we haven't got that kind of a being mm -hmm. there at all. We've just got the whole of reality with an inherent telos. Now, of course, um, some people might argue that it, uh, you know, it doesn't make conceptual sense to talk about things having inherent purposes, right? Um, that the only way anything can have a purpose is if it's um, imposed on it by a mind. Now, I don't, know, I don't know whether you were suggesting that earlier or whether when you were saying there's a connection between purpose and mind, it's, uh, there is such a connection, but it needn't necessarily be of that kind. So, so this kind of view of reality is, so to speak, attributing mind you know, to reality with with a capital M to reality itself, mm -hmm. in a way that, interestingly enough, um, Hume acknowledged might be a possibility um, in his dialogues concerning natural religion, or at least he has Philo in um, in the last uh, in section twelve of those dialogues admit that, even though he has strongly criticised. Um, the teleological argument as an argument for the existence of an anthropomorphic style God. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the things that's very interesting is when you look at people who are sort of put forward as prime atheists and you look at them again and say, might it be that what they were atheistic about was just this particular conception mm -hmm. of right, God right. and they were leaving open other understandings, um, you know, to say that 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 could be true of Hume is really quite interesting. That is interesting, and yeah. I, that seems very plausible to me just in my own conversations with atheists. I was just having a conversation the other day, as a side note, with a gentleman who was an atheist, and I found myself agreeing with all of his arguments. I don't consider myself an atheist. I thought, by that criteria, what you're arguing against, I completely agree. Yes. So, so you're right. Maybe this opens the possibility for being an atheist Christian. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this, exactly. This terminology. Okay, so let me ask you a couple more questions on this. This is a very interesting conception of God. What that way of thinking about God doesn't get you, which I find helpful in the tr more traditional way of thinking about God, is the cause of existence itself. So like the we have this love generating machine. I like thinking of it, of it that way. And in fact, I can even take out the purpose. I can say it's not that there is purpose as we think about it. It's that kind of by natural processes, what generates love promotes love itself. It's kind of like a self-perpetuating cycle. And what generates not love generates death, kind of extinguishes itself without necessarily any purpose. But I still don't have an explanation for why that system exists in the first place. Right. Um, and it, surely it is characteristic of theism that it does say there is an ultimate explanation for why anything is, exists at all, mm -hmm. why there is something rather than nothing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I want to claim that this view, um, which um, the colleague and I who are currently writing a book on this call Uteleology, um, that this view uh, does allow you to give an ultimate um, explanation of all that is, okay. um, so long as you're prepared to be pluralist about efficient causation. Okay. Um, now, we normally now think of efficient causation as really a matter of, of the cause as producer bringing about its effect, right? Um, but strictly speaking, an efficient cause is just whatever explains the actuality of the effect. Okay. Right. Um, and 
Um, clearly, if reality as a whole is going to have an ultimate efficient cause, right, um, it can't be in terms of its producer, because its producer would then be part of reality as a whole, and you know, then mm. you wouldn't have an answer. Mm. So, uh, so what we claim is that the ultimate explanation of the existence of reality uh, is the concrete realization of its telos, the supreme good. So that the um, what explains why um, anything exists at all is the fact that what exists um, contains realizations of the supreme good. And would you, so realizations of the supreme good meaning love? Yes, yes. Now, of course, this, this looks like it's absurd bootstra bootstrapping, and of course it would be um, if you're thinking of efficient causality as, uh, in terms of a producer, but we're saying you don't have to do that. And I think there's quite a long tradition that recognizes that you don't. I mean, one of the things that's worth exploring, and our view has some similarities to it, um, is the, uh, what's called the axiarchic view um, of ultimate explanation for existence. Um, which you find in Plato, and which John Leslie has elaborated recently, and is also defended by um, uh, a philosopher at Oxford called Hugh Rice, um, that um, reality exists because it is good that it should do so. That the, the, the <laughs> okay. sheer, um, now, um, it's not clear that, that, that if you're looking for ultimate explanations, that that isn't a possible candidate. I mean, ultimate explanations are going to be very special, by the way, because, right. you know, they're supposed to be explaining everything, right? And I mean, most of the time, what we're familiar with is explanations of some things in terms of other things and so on, you know. But, we're, but in this theological context, we're doing something very bold and thinking about ultimate explanations of the whole, and they are going to be of unique types. Right. So it sounds like the reason I, I, that, at least, of course, all I've heard is a sentence, so I can't act like I have a full understanding of the, the depth of that argument. But the way that I view existence is something like a system. It's, it is an existent system of things that all interact. And, yes, yes. But it would be difficult for me to think there is a principle, there's like a system principle that exists by itself. So something like what is inherently good is the explanation for the system. It sounds like, well, you still have this principle of what is good being the generator of existent things or something like yes. that. Yes. Well, so where fact, does that principle come from? Yeah. Well, we're, uh, I mean, yes. I mean, it is, it looks as if, you know, the good in itself is somehow too abstract to be an ultimate efficient cause of anything or, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, I, uh, so that's why on, on the account that I'm giving, um, the, uh, the ultimate efficient cause um, is a fact that has to do with things that are completely concrete, namely the actual realization of the uh, supreme good within reality. So, but it certainly is something about the concrete nature of the system explains why it exists at all. As an explanation or as a causal explanation? So it's, is it the cause of it or is it just the explanation of it? Well, it depends. It's, it's not the productive clause. It's the, it's the explanation of its actuality, which but, is what an efficient cause has to Okay, be. so is there no, is there, will we say there is no productive cause? No, uh, no productive cause, no, no. There can, uh, I mean, of course, okay. product, productive causes are absolutely essential um, to, uh, to get concrete realizations of the supreme good within the system, but there's no overall productive cause of that system. That's the view. Now, okay. this... Now we think I love that, as that a matter idea, of fact, but I want to understand this it. idea is is quite familiar within um, Christian thinking. Okay. As a matter of fact, because um, remember that um, in the first chapter of John, it is said of of the Word that was with God from the beginning, that without Him was not anything made that was made. Right. Um, but that word is given birth, so to speak, within the system. 
And so, for example, you get um, doctrines like um, Mary being the Theotokos, you know, the, the bearer of God, um, or um, uh, so, that, so that she actually gives birth to her most wonderful creator, right? So this is, you know, this looks very bootstrapping in terms of, um, um, uh, you know, productive causation, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but what we're really saying is the, the one who is, is the ultimate explanation for her very existence is one who depends on her to be given life, right? Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and Jesus is said to be root and flower of Jesse's stem, right? So he's descended from Jesse, right? Um, but he is the root of that whole, you know? Uh, so this kind of idea is not, uh, is not sort of theologically outrageous, um, although it's sort of philosophically um, rather challenging, but I think also quite exciting. <laughs> um, it sort of sends shivers down the back of one's spine. Well, this uh, is a perfect segue. This is a perfect segue from th philosophy, theology, and epistemology. So my disposition is to think I'm pretty much all in the philosophy basket, where I have experienced love, and part of my love experience what totally changed my worldview in many ways. I thought, okay, in a sense, this seems like an explanation for why anything exists. It's hard to explain, but yeah. in that state, I was thinking, this is this, this is, is what true. It's all about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, however, that doesn't come with any theology, and so I'm trying to I'm trying to piece together just rationally, philosophically, how can I understand this and make sense of it w without including any tradition, any orthodoxy, any theology. If there's good stuff in the theology, let's, I want to extract it and try to make sense of it. But with most people who are religious that I've spoken with, either pastors or uh, theologians, central is this concept of faith. And you brought it up, you used a, faith, a, a, a phrase earlier, which I, was in Latin, but it, it's... I've done a memory. Oh, exactly. Fide is quirens intellectum. Yes, and what so was the translation of that? Faith seeking understanding, okay. which kind of gives a priority to faith. Yes. But, but nevertheless emphasizes the importance of, of uh, intellectual understanding. So can we talk about that? Because sure, my, yes. I, if I could reverse it, that would be my, my position, is seeking understanding, and if it leads to faith, okay, but only if it's, well, only you can understand why. So, so right. let's talk about faith. First of all, we should start with definitions. What do, we, what do you mean by faith? Because I know in my circles growing up, there was a, a base level conception of faith, which is essentially blind faith or belief in the absence of any reasons whatsoever. Yeah. And then I've also heard people say, no, no, faith is something like trust. It's a reasoned trust. Um, what do you mean by faith? Right. Well, if we can articulate some sort of religious view of the world, which is what we've really been doing, right? Um, uh, we've been putting forward an interpretation of theism um, that might make sense of it without postulating this um, omnipotent, om omnibenevolent um, personal agent who's superintending everything. Mm -hmm. um, so now we've switch to the epistemological and we're asking, well, what reason might we have for believing uh, that such a view of the world is true? Um, now, when you ask me what I think faith is, I think the first thing I want to say is that what's really central is not so much the state of believing that something is true, the psychological state of having the attitude towards a proposition that it's true, right? Although I, I don't want to leave that out of the picture. But I think the core of it um, is much more like trusting something um, 
and, and I would characterize it simply as practical commitment to um, a certain um, proposition that you hmm. know, articulates a view of the world, um, uh, where, of course, I mean, if this is going to be a religious view of the world, it surely must be um, something that makes a difference, and indeed a profound difference, to um, the way one lives one's life, mm -hmm. right? Um, hmm. so, so if we say that what's at the core of this is making and, and presumably continually renewing, um, perhaps in certain ways revising, a commitment to a certain world view that has implications for how you live your life, right? Um, there's a question of, where, is it justifiable to do that? Right? Um, and, and under what conditions is it justifiable? Um, well, it might be said, since this worldview is purporting to be, um, to tell us what reality is like, you know, what is this reality of which we are a part and in which we, um, uh, you know, in, with which we are engaging when we act? Um, we really uh, need to have adequate evidence that this is true. Mm -hmm. right. um, and in general, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty important. Um, that um, when you, uh, in practice, commit yourself to something's being the case, you've got good reason for thinking that that really is the case, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in any situation where it's going to matter to, uh, to yourself and to other people um, how you act. Right? Um, so obviously, caring about evidence is very important. But I think in these religious contexts, there's a bit of a problem with that because um, what we're dealing with is a total view of the world that orients your whole life, right? Um, and which um, seems to be sort of presupposed by any assessment of any evidence that you've got, right? Um, what uh, I think John Hick calls a total interpretation of reality. Hmm. Um, or I like to call it a highest order framing principle, a way of, of, of framing things. And if it's a highest order framing principle, um, then it doesn't seem as if there's any sort of standing point outside it. Mm -hmm. um, you either sort of buy into it or you don't, right? Um, and uh, so unfortunately, the, the evidentialist imperative, don't commit yourself until you've got adequate evidence, mm -hmm. um, seems just to be inapplicable. Um, how, however worthy that imperative is, it seems to be inapplicable to this context. And this is an argument which uh, is famously set out um, you know, by William James in his um, lecture, 1896 lecture, The Will to Believe, um, which I've certainly been very influenced by and have thought a lot about. Um, and I think what he's saying is, in a situation where the evidence can't decide there would be something bizarre about insisting that you mustn't decide, but eternally remain undecided, right? Um, and he thinks that it can then be reasonable and justifiable, both uh, epistemically and morally, to commit yourself <coughs> if you have the resources to do so, which will be a sort of, whether you do have the resources to do so, will be a matter of kind of historical accident. You know, you <coughs> so that so that a Christian um, under this circumstances says, "Well, I, well, I haven't got um, rationally compelling evidence that would require anybody in my situation to commit to Christianity." There are there are other worldviews, there are other total interpretations that will actually make coherent sense of it all as well, right? Um, but given that I've been brought up in this, and given that um, uh, you know, it, it engages with my passional self, right, and, in, and, and has something inspiring about it, right, um, it's, uh, it can be legitimate for me to commit myself beyond what any evidence could guarantee um, and take it to be true in the way I live my life. And now that, now, now finally come back to faith, that is what I think the step of faith is. 
Um, okay. It does involve, in a certain sense, going beyond evidence, though in a situation where you're certainly not going contrary to any evidence. So you, you know, you're not going to be able to use this, um, for example, to defend committing yourself to a form of faith that, um, say, uh, insists on literal um, uh, young world creationism, for mm -hmm. example. Um, so can I ask you a few short questions yes. just on that? Okay. So, would this be a fair way to rephrase what you're saying, that in your conception, you're kind of talking about ultimate, from an ultimate worldview perspective, Yeah. The biggest way that you interpret, even the way that you interpret evidence, you have yes, beliefs exactly. about how you interpret evidence. So, the beliefs about how you interpret evidence can't necessarily come from evidence per se, there's a, there's a prior step. Before you even evaluate the evidence, you have some kind of worldview you're bringing to the table. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's right. Although, of course, that worldview will be sort of uh, subject to quite a con uh, an important objective test as to whether it it manages to hold it all together. I mean, it's it's claiming to be this highest order framing principle, this total interpretation. Well, does it actually do the job? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and if it sort of fragments things. Um, and says, oh, well, no, we have to discount all this scientific evidence about evolution or something of this kind, then, then I would say it's not going to be satisfactory. But doesn't that imply then that our epistemological criteria still lay outside all the other claims? So you have this kind of hierarchy. You could either view it the way that I, I recently wrote a book on logic and basic ideas in epistemology. Yes. And the analogy I gave was of a tree where a tree, you don't have branches and leaves floating by themselves. All the leaves are connected to the branches, the branches are connected to the trunk, the trunk grows out of its roots. Mm. And the roots are, I would say, logic and epistemology, and then you get more derivative beliefs that kind of flow from that. Mm. Wouldn't that, what you just said about if your faith goes against the scientific evidence, then you have to kind of revise that fundamental worldview. Wouldn't that imply that there are these roots or these, this fundamental um, position of maybe even rationalism, that I'm going to try to follow wherever the evidence leads using my reason and application of logic, that that's, that really is fundamental and all the religious stuff is derivative? It's like part of the, part of the leaves and the branches? Well, I, I think um, I agree that the, this... Uh, you know, these rational requirements are fundamental, right? But I don't, um, I don't think it follows that the religious stuff is somehow derivative um, and dependent on that. Because, of course, it m there might be reasons why the religious perspective, because that's the total interpretation, um, you know, values um, the uh, the fundamental rationality mm. that we find ourselves, so to speak, given in our very nature, so right? Are you so that we would no. see that. So from from that point of view, it's uh, it's by the grace of God that we uh, you know we're able to do this. So I don't think that is putting religion in the in the derivative position. If okay. you see what I mean. So so let me. So this is this question. I'll get right at it. Are you saying that the base level orientation of pursuing the truth with our minds is fundamentally based on faith? Is that how you're using the term? Uh, well, I mean, um, there, th there are specific faith worldviews from which, you know, that is an absolutely fundamental element as to what we are and what we need to pursue um, in order to, you know, fulfill the the purposes for which we exist, etc. Yes. So you can't have, or would you say it's illusory to think that you have rationality prior to faith belief? Um, well, I mean, obviously people people may not consciously be committing themselves to a faith belief and be you know, patently um, concerned about matters of rationality. So uh, 
So if you mean you can't have rationality prior to faith belief, um, I mean, so that would suggest that that, that claim must be false, right? Um, in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. um, now, it, uh, I think that the, the point that I'm wanting to make here um, is that, um, of course, people can share a concern about rationality independently of what their faith beliefs are, right? Um, and there may be faith beliefs out there, right, um, which um, attempt to give human rationality some um, very subordinate place or which are suspicious of it and which, um, which actually advocate a form of faith that accepts things that uh, um, would be re judged universally as contrary to reason. Mm -hmm. There could be such things out there, um, but there are other there are other faith beliefs. You know the ones that I'm attracted to, which say precisely the opposite. So I mean, what I'm in, uh, what I'm concerned to say is there's a possibility of an overall interpretation of reality that you accept by faith, right? that sees reason and, uh, and what goes beyond it um, as absolutely in harmony um, okay. so how and, and understands the roots of, our, of all our capacities, our capacities for reason and our capacities to um, accept um, faith as all depending on divine grace. Um, okay, so the, the, the question that I have is, if you're looking at these different worldviews, these different faith worldviews as they're presented, some emphasize rationality, some are irrational or explicitly. Yes. You have this. How do you choose? How do you choose? Yes, yes, yes. By what standards? That's right. Okay. So, so obviously, um, you know, the uh, the account of faith that I've given, right, um, raises the question under um, under what conditions is it justifiable um, to accept in practice a particular worldview? from um, beyond the evidence, right? Um, and uh, uh, I mean, I, I've written a book about this, um, which was pub published now 10 years ago now, um, called Believing by Faith. And it, it really is d a defense of the kind of fideism that um, William James defended. And here we're using fideism as a position that takes faith beyond the idea of commitment beyond the evidence seriously and rather than just dismissing it as obviously irrational. Um, it's, uh, it's not fideism in the sense of a position that rejects rationality altogether. Mm -hmm. right? um, but um, but a, a really important question is um, what, you know, what are the constraints on this? Um, under what conditions is it justifiable? Mm -hmm. And what I, what I argued in my book um, was that at this point we really have to bring in um, ethical considerations. Um, we have to um, assess um, what's motivating our commitment, um, given that it's, it's not based on a rational assessment of evidence and can't be, um, well, the what James calls the passional motivation for it, I think, has to be of an ethically acceptable kind, right? Um, but uh, the content of the worldview has to be has to display a world um, about which we can make the judgment. Um, the world being like that would be a good way of being. You know, um, now, of course, that, that this, of course, is now going to raise questions about the epistemology of where you get your um, fundamental values from. Right. And of course, those fundamental values, right, are not going to are going to have to be part of what's incorporated in this total interpretation, right? Um, so, so there are worries about um, that um, my account gets into um, about possibly a, um, a religious worldview kind of endorsing itself by its own values, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> even though from a sort of external point of view, we would say um, 
it's not acceptable. So you can sort of imagine somebody whose religious worldview um, uh, involved gods of a Nazi kind. Because mm -hmm. right. um, I mean, some people ha have interpreted sure. Nazism as a kind of religion. You know, um, so the gods who think that human destiny is fulfilled um, by ensuring um, racial purity and making you know the highest form of man uh, the only one that's allowed to flourish or mm -hmm. something of this kind. Um, and obviously, from the values that are inherent in that, a world like that would be very good, mm -hmm. right? And yet we want to say it's a monstrosity, right? right. Um, so um, I think here we, ha we have to appeal to, um, you know, the, uh, the j just as we, we must appeal to the, um, the human endeavor of understanding the natural world through science, which I think belongs to humans generally and isn't a purely cultural um, product, but maybe that some people would think that was very controversial. Similarly, we have to think that there is a developing um, human consensus about ethical values um, against which we can judge um, particular commitments. Um, but of course those, I mean, that developing dialogue about um, uh, ethical reality, so to speak, um, is something to which the various religious traditions will be contributing. Okay. Um, so, so I suppose I, I don't think uh, on my well. Um, so, so in other words, um, the thing that I want to say is where we can't settle it by evidence, right? Um, we we can at least consider whether the view of the world that it's putting forward can be judged to be true, right? And and there is a possibility of um, endorsing that from a perspective um, that isn't just completely internal to that religious worldview. Okay. Right? Um, and um, so I think criteria of that kind are going to be needed. And I would think then that when we go back to, uh, say, a kind of worldview that um, really fragments things and says that, okay, there's, there's ordinary rationality here, but by faith you've got to contradict what's um, mm -hmm. um, is still. That, that, I mean, I, I would think that that has a defect in that very compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, there's, there's a kind of integrationist value which um, I think we ought to endorse, you know. But, but of course at this point, one can only make judgments about what you think the objective position is. Nobody's got any final um, authority to say what it actually is. Okay, so let me try to... Um, Sorry, there was rather a lot there. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me try to rephrase that and see if this is a fair restatement of your position. That in the analysis of a worldview, your biggest possible interpretation of explaining how things are, the way that they are, trying to make sense of the world. That includes perspectives on rationality and logical reasoning and science. Yes. And the, if there are multiple worldviews, some more rational th than others, then the way that one judges what worldview to take is based on ethical beliefs and those ethical beliefs are ultimately judged in a similar way that scientific consensus is judged. Yes. So it's humans trying to discover ethical beliefs, and then from there we get the worldview. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Now, yes. what would you say, because my thought is, is to say, well, you still, well, there's three layers of criticism that I would intuitively think. One is people can be wrong. So that doesn't mean you're going to have an accurate worldview. No. no, no, that's right. The other would be um, that still seems like it puts the rational analysis, even if it's uh, uh, like group rational analysis trying to discover ethical truths, it still seems like that's outside the system. That's still outside the worldview. To say I value the consensus of humans in what they think sound ethics 
are. That seems that still seems like it's saying, this is my my rational judgment that this is the way we arrive at ethical truths. So doesn't that kind of put the cart before the horse? Versus my position would be to say, rather before we get any complex worldview, before we start talking about science or groups of people getting to ethics, the ethics don't come first. The epistemology comes first. The, the rationality comes first. The rationality is the thing that is prior. It's not the ethics that's prior. It's the, rationality is prior to the ethics. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, I mean, um, well, that can't really be so because if you're valuing rationality, that is itself a value stance, isn't it? But the, so, but the value stance is still not prior to the epistemological claims, right? So you still need some kind of analysis of where value, where you get your values, and I would say you can get you can get those values from rational analysis. Um, that's a possibility, and of course, famously, that's the possibility that Kant pursues, hmm. um, because basically what he's saying is that um, if only we exercise our practical reason consistently, that will then produce substantial moral principles, mm -hmm. um, which is an extremely exciting idea, but it doesn't actually seem to work. I mean, uh, um, I think it turns out that he's always building into rationality certain presuppositions that he doesn't kind of notice that the things that he just thinks are given by rationality are actually rationally contestable. Mm -hmm. So I would myself tend to be a little bit more humane about rationality. Um, so. So I suppose I'm not confident that the values can just come out of rationality. What do you think itself. the values come from? Um, I think they come from a certain fundamental set of values, a kind of given, again, this is a somewhat Humean thought, um, just um, because of the kind of beings that we are. Yeah. And so they come out of human nature or something mm. like that. Um, mm. but, but then, of course, I think um, that although that gives us a good grounding, right, um, they don't actually, um, they don't give us in, um, intuitions that rise up as far as what the supreme good is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think um, we need revelation. We can only get values by revelation. Um, and so that ultimately we do need to appeal to one of these religious worldviews that m might makes a rather specific claim about what the revelation actually is. I think that's unavoidable. One of the things that I'm interested in, and I, I, mean, I haven't explored this enough, is I think that revelation is a much more central um, uh, epistemological category hmm. um, than philosophers have been prepared to admit. Um, I mean, the general view that we have of revelation is that it's, you know, it's some th something really quite wacky out there where a group of people imagine that they're hearing the voice of God right, or something right, of this right. kind. Um, and uh, I, would, I would want to defend a sort of epistemology of revelation that makes it much more central. I, I love that. That's an excellent place to end. Um, my own experience, you could put in that context and say, when one experiences love as deep as I have experienced it and other people have experienced it, one will experience revelation in that sense. <laughs> that's how I would put it. Yes, I, I, I believe that's true. Well, thank you so much for the conversation. This has been fantastic. Good. Thank you, Steve. All right, that was my interview with Professor John Bishop of the University of Auckland. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I loved that conversation. As I'm pursuing what it means for me to have a positive belief in some kind of God, I'm really interested in the non-personal conceptions. There's a great deal in this interview that obviously I can't wait to break down because there's so much material, but also I found personally compelling. I thought it was very beautiful, this idea of thinking of the universe as a love generation machine. Um, I, I like that. I have to think about it. So what do you guys think? Do you have any non-standard conceptions of God that you find persuasive, or do you think it's all just a crock -a hooey Let me know what you think in the comments. 
on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Steve Patterson. And if you haven't already subscribed over there, make sure to subscribe because I'm releasing, in addition to these podcasts and narrated articles, I'm also releasing regular weekly YouTube videos, which are short and punchy, talking about issues that I'm not talking about on the show. So that's all for today. I'll talk to you again soon as we continue the pursuit of truth.